And we are back, this time with the first PlayStation 3 restoration on the channel. I have a couple of faulty PS3s in the backlog, and the first of these right here is an L01 model. These are some of the last PS3 fats that Sony made before releasing the slim model. Cosmetically, this unit's actually in pretty decent shape other than being a little bit dusty. We do, however, have a busted HDMI port. There's no salvaging this port, it needs to be replaced. We're gonna do that and restore the unit, get it looking as good as we can. The warranty sticker on this PS3 is still intact. That's always a great sign. It means no one's been in there before, so our odds for success should be pretty good. Before we get inside this unit, I have it hooked up to my capture card over composite video, just to quickly check if everything else is working. So I'll go ahead and pop in a game to test out the disk drive and make sure the controllers work as well. It looks like the previous owners already cleared the system. There's no profile information or any game save data. Skipping ahead a little bit, the disk drive's working just fine. Game starts right up. Here, it's actually trying to do an 8 gig install. I let it go for a minute just to make sure there was no funny business, but I think I'm satisfied that the console is working just fine. So I'm ready to open it up and try and swap out that HDMI port. I'm gonna try and salvage the warranty sticker and reapply it when we're done, just from a preservation perspective. Although you can usually tell when a warranty sticker has been reapplied, depending how much care was taken in the process, it can sometimes look like it was never even removed. So just something to look out for if you're ever shopping for one, especially if it's one of the collectible models, those can certainly fetch a premium. Removing just that one screw releases the glossy top cover, exposing a bunch of screws underneath to release the top case. We'll definitely give this guy a bubble bath later. One of the things you'll see in a lot of take apart guides online is that the Blu-ray drive is actually the first thing that needs to come out. That's actually not the case for these later revision PS3 fats. The power supply needs to come out first to expose the connector that releases the Blu-ray drive. This little guy right here is the Wi-Fi antenna. This is the grounding screw. It has a crush washer and a flat washer. It's different from all the other screws in the system, so we need to make sure we keep things organized. The hard drive could have actually come out at the very beginning, but taking it out now before I remove the rest of the hard drive assembly. I teased this in my last video, but in a few weeks, we're actually gonna be working on a launch model PS3, and all of this is gonna look quite different. Externally, all the PS3 fats look pretty similar, but the hardware changes are quite significant, and it kind of feels like you're taking apart a different system. I took a note of the numbering and orientation of these CPU clamps. They can actually be swapped around and rotated 180 degrees, but I want them to go back in the exact same way that they came out. Now, in the case of this console, the motherboard release with almost no effort. But if you ever work on an older revision PS3 fat, don't be surprised if you have to wrestle the motherboard out. The thermal paste can sometimes feel like cement. Here, it's mostly just dried up and probably well overdue for reapplication. I'll have to blast this guy with my air compressor, make sure we get all those fins squeaky clean. And that's the full teardown. Now, as for replacement HDMI ports, these are salvaged from broken consoles and I had to buy them all the way from China. I couldn't find any new replacements for the PS3 FAT. It's a very unique port. However, that mounting hole was dropped in this revision of the PS3. So this will be a good replacement for a launch model, but it's gonna need some modification to work on this PS3. Luckily, it's a very easy modification, so let's go ahead and get that taken care of.
And there we are, now it looks identical to the one we're about to remove from the board. Here I'm just tinning the soldering iron and getting it ready to introduce some leaded solder to the pins on the HDMI connector. That's going to help lower the melting point and make removing the HDMI port a little bit easier. There's a total of 20 pins on this connector, in addition to the four legs that anchor the port to the board. So here I'm just going over them a couple of times to make sure that I mix that chemistry across every single one of those pins. I've been messing around with hot air on some junk boards for a couple of days, but this will be my first actual repair using hot air. Up until now, I've gotten away with using a low melt alloy like Chipquick with just my soldering iron for jobs like this. But I'm eager to start building some skills with hot air, so that's what we're going to use to remove this HDMI port here. The hot air gun's at 420 Celsius, fan speed 7. I don't have a nozzle installed, even my largest nozzle is a little bit too narrow for the size of this port. I inhaled more flux fumes than I want to admit over the last few days working with the hot air rework station. I have ordered a fume extractor and it's on the way. I've put off buying some of these things for as long as I can, but you just need the right tools for the job. And a fume extractor is probably something I should have bought a long time ago. Skipping ahead a little bit, I'm about 45-50 seconds in. I switched to a pair of forceps so that I could grab the port a little bit easier, but I could feel it starting to move and it just released and pulled right out. I don't see any rip pads. This was the part of the project that I was dreading the most and honestly it could not have gone any better. But as it turns out, I wasn't out of the woods yet. I still need to clear all the solder from those through holes and prepare them for the new connector. And this is not the part of the project that I was expecting to give me a hard time, but as you guys are about to see, that's exactly what ended up happening. I'm using good quality solder, flux and braid. I've used this technique many times before, not necessarily on pins that are this small or this many at the same time, but I just add a bunch of flux, I wet all the pads, and then I wick them off with some soldering braid. So far so good, those through holes are slowly opening up one at a time and everything looks like it's going according to plan. Not bad for a first pass, I have about 5 through holes that haven't opened up, so I'm going to reapply some leaded solder and try again. And on the second pass, I still didn't manage to open up all those through holes. And I didn't notice this right away, but some of the solder resist was actually beginning to come off the board. If you're unfamiliar with what that is, that's basically the green mask that separates all the vias and traces on the board. Now, I had to trim out some of this footage, otherwise you'd basically be watching me repeating this exact same process five, six, seven more times. But we're just going to skip ahead and look at the end result. I managed to clear them all up, although I wasn't very happy with the result. All the traces looked like they were still there, so I felt like I had a good shot at just moving ahead with the repair, but exposing all that copper made soldering that connector a lot more difficult than it probably needed to be. Here I'm inserting the new HDMI connector. 
I brought the board really close to my face to make sure I had all those pins lined up and I didn't realize that I was a little bit out of frame in the shot. Here, I've already anchored the four corners of the connector. I add flux to all the pins and try my hand at some drag soldering to wet all the joints. I do zoom in in a second so you guys can get a better look, but I'm not using a microscope or anything and those pins are pretty tiny so it can be a little bit difficult to see with the camera in the way. Multimeter in continuity mode, making sure I don't have any shorts and that all my connections are good. Now, I do have some bridges in that center row, but all of those are ground pins, so I'm not concerned about those. I just need to make sure that nothing else is shorted to ground that's not supposed to be. Here's a pin out of the connector showing the ground pins, so if we get a beep on those green pins, that's no problem. But there should be no beep on any of the white pins. All those are either data or power lines. I just found my first short, pin number four. I'm gonna have to reflow that. And I have another short, pin number 19. I'm gonna have to reflow that pin as well. When I said earlier that I made soldering this connector harder than it needed to be, this is what I was referring to. These pins are really small and clustered together and by having exposed metal between them, it just made it that much easier for solder to jump across and bridge. In any case, pin 19 is good. That's no longer shorted. Let's go ahead and reflow pin four. Having good quality flux is incredibly helpful with situations like this. It makes quick work of resolving those bridges and helping solder flow back to its own pad where it's supposed to be. And that takes care of pin four. The short is gone. I'm glad that's over. Let's continue with this restoration. This is the PRAM battery and it's completely dead. It's not holding a charge. This is the replacement battery. We should be getting three volts and we're getting 3.26. Perfect. Time to clean the CPU and GPU in preparation for some fresh thermal paste. I now like to use cotton balls when I'm cleaning CPUs or aluminum heat sinks. I've noticed from past repairs that even paper towels can cause very visible scratches on a CPU package or an aluminum heat sink because the metal is just very soft. So using a cotton ball saturated with 99% IPA, we're not gonna create any scratches whatsoever. That's already looking really slick. A little dish soap and warm water goes a long way.
All right, here we are ready to test the system over HDMI. And as you can tell by the imperfections on the warranty sticker that I reattached, this is the same system that I was working on. Oh, and if you're not following along the channel and you're wondering why my TV is sitting on top of a shipping crate, I relocated to Oregon a month ago and we bought our first house. And beyond the essentials, we still don't have any furniture. All right, guys, as always, thanks for watching. I promised you guys a 10K subscriber giveaway, so here's your chance to win one of two TS100 soldering irons, one entry per subscriber. I'll ship it worldwide. All you have to do is like this video, subscribe if you haven't already, and within three days, 72 hours of this video being uploaded, leave a comment that starts with the word, hmm. I'll draw the winners just like I did for my last giveaway and announce it in the next upload. I look forward to reading your comments, guys. Good luck.